It's so good for us to sing about how worthy our God is and why it matters that we worship him as a church family. Whether you're joining us on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, or the website, we're just glad that you're with us to worship our God and declare that he alone is worthy. And that, that's the reason at Chapel Street Church that we are passionate about becoming a family of neighborhood churches, reproducing ourselves in neighborhoods and communities so that more people would know about the grace and glory and how worthy God is and how much he loves them. And if you've been around, you know we've talked about our North Aurora campus and the expansion project and the fact that the construction is underway, remodeling is underway, Pastor Andrew is recruiting a core team to go and uh, launch there this coming fall and we have a unique opportunity financially uh, to, to make this happen without any debt. It's our matching challenge. Somebody has generously volunteered to match every dollar given up to 50% of what's left on that project and that was $1.1 million. Now, I'm thrilled to tell you that we're already approaching $300,000 given toward this matching challenge. We're almost halfway there. So I just want to encourage you, if you call Chapel Street Church your home, whatever campus you attend, or even if it's online, would you prayerfully consider what you might contribute so that we could launch this campus debt-free this fall so that more people would know about the worthy grace and glory of our good God. Let's pray together before we get into the sermon. God, thank you that you alone are worthy. Forgive us for the way that we sometimes attach worth to the wrong objects. As we come now to your word, we ask you to tune our minds and hearts to what you want to say, that we might hear from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we come to a section in our series called Living Hope on the letter of 1 Peter, where Peter's going to address the very relevant and important critical issue of marriage. I, I, honestly, I can't say that without thinking about the Princess Bride. It makes me want to say, we come to the subject of marriage. <laughs> but there you go. It's a controversial subject in our culture. It's a powerful subject and beautiful subject in God's word. And I think it's often misunderstood. And quite frankly, marriage in our culture is becoming less and less popular. People are less interested in it, uh, getting married later in life. And God has something to say to us about his vision for what marriage really is. Now, for those of you out there that are, uh, that are single, you're not married, or maybe you have been at one time or you long to be, uh, it might be tempting for you to want to tune this one out. Don't do that because it's very important. And I wanted to tell you that just because you're not married doesn't mean you're lesser in God's sight. Marriage, as important as it is, is not ultimate. And as a single person, you can fulfill all that God has for you and live out his calling on your life uh, should he call you into a marriage or not. And this text is going to I hopefully give you a picture of God's love, God's spousal love for all of us. For those of you that long to be married, and are hoping for that and praying for that, this passage, I'm praying, will be, give you clarity for what it is you're praying for and preparing for. And for those of you, perhaps, who have been wounded by a toxic marriage or even a failed marriage, it's my prayer that this passage and this sermon would encourage you and maybe would restore the distorted image that you experienced. There are many reasons that we might be predisposed not to hear what God's word has to say on the issue of marriage. And I'm praying that God will give us all the grace to lay aside our defenses and to really hear what he has to say. So to help us do that, before uh, we launch into the text, I thought it would be good for all of us to hear from some Chapel Street couples who have several decades of marital wisdom um, in, in their experience and to hear from them what they have to say to us. Let's listen together. Who asked who out first? Oh, should we tell him? Go ahead. Uh, we were, I sat behind him in our English class, and one day over his shoulder comes a note. <laughs> I like two girls, you and Chris. Which one should I go with? <laughs> I wrote me, crossed out Chris, and <clears throat> tossed it back. <laughs> There's one thing that I, I think is key to a, a good Christian marriage is forgiveness. Without forgiveness and the spirit of forgiveness, it's impossible to love. Love is what comes from forgiveness. And before we can love one another, we must be able to forgive and forget. And I think we've tried to do that in our marriage. One of the key things I think in a relationship 
is to be kind to one another. And those little tiny acts of kindness grow into a big pile, a good pile of things. Every day looking for that way to serve is so incredibly important because over time that starts to build up to be a normalcy of your marriage and you just, you're always finding ways to serve because marriage is not 50-50, marriage is 100-100. We don't hold grudges. And we don't expect perfection. Amen. And that's why we've been so happy. <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind as far as speaking to a young couple would be to watch your expectations. Go into it with a heart of how can I complete the other person, not how can the other person serve me. Go into it knowing the role of, of a husband and wife from a biblical perspective. I think it's important to uh, read the word together. Prayer together, meals together. Marriage is kind of like two sinners committing to stay together till one of you dies. And if you love somebody more Why'd you look at me when you said somebody died? Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're the other sinner in this group. Okay. Well. <laughs> I, if, but seriously, if, if you love God more than you love me, and if you are kind, then all the other things that come into marriage, you can work through them. God knew what he was doing when he put us, us together, I'll tell you, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah we had, we've had our ups and downs, I'll tell you. But... Uh, through it all, victory. What a gift it is just to listen uh, to those couples share wisdom from the years that God has given them together. You know, as we filmed that, I sat there for over an hour and listened to couples, those couples tell wonderful stories and some hard things about their marriage together and just hearing God's grace evident in the way that they have loved each other was such a good gift. And we just gave you a little taste there. We could almost stop right there. Um, but when we come to the Bible's teaching about marriage, context is always crucial. And so now Peter's going to move and talk to us about what God's vision for marriage is, but he's doing that in the context of the broader call to live lives of holiness that God has called us to. And last week, Pastor Andrew talked to us specifically about what this looks like as surrendered servants in the world, living under earthly authorities. So let's look back for a minute at 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 16. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. I love that. Use your freedom to live as a servant in the world, a servant of God first. So we live as surrendered servants to authority in the world, not because those authorities are always right or good, but out of honoring an honoring lifestyle to God first. So there, when we come now to this passage on marriage, Peter is taking that same concept of being subject and looking at it, what it looks like when a man and a woman come together in the covenant of marriage. Here we are, 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, 
no question, some of you listening to this uh, hear, heard some of those passages and some of those phrases, and it caused you to squirm a bit. You might be even feeling a little bit triggered. Uh, interestingly, the same thing was true in the first century in those churches in Asia Minor that Peter first wrote to, but for different cultural reasons, as we'll see. When Peter says, be subject, he's using the same Greek phrase he used in chapter 2. Be subject is the Greek word hupotasso, and it means to willingly place yourself under authority. To place yourself under. It's not coerced. It's not, you're not strong-armed into it. It's a willing surrender and submission and placing yourself under an authority that God has ordained. Okay, now... Before we can talk about what this means, we have to talk about what it does not mean. Because we're not going to hear this at all, the beauty of what God is saying. If, if we can't understand, talk about some of the abuses and some of the corruptions that, that have been very real in not so, not so distant past. I know there are some of you listening who cannot hear these words without thinking of how they were used to justify sinful or abusive behavior. Okay, so what biblical submission is not? Let's talk about what it is not. First, biblical submission does not mean enduring abuse. I wish this didn't need to be said, but it does need to be said. God is not calling any woman anywhere to endure physical, emotional, or spiritual abuse. I read a recent article that said it's passages like these in the Bible that are the cause for domestic violence in the church. It was sad to read that article. What are we to do with passages like this? Do we just tear them out of our Bible? Do we just ignore them, throw them away? I believe with all my heart that these words can actually, rightly understood, be healing words rather than hurtful words. But let me just say, if you are watching this and you are in an abusive relationship, if this is, describes your situation, that is not God's will for you. And you need to reach out for help. To us, email us, call us at the church, let us know, talk to the authorities. We will walk with you. We have people that would help you leave that situation. You are not called to submit to abuse. Second, biblical submission does not mean silent compliance. It's not a call for wives to just go along with whatever harebrained, selfish, or foolish idea their husbands may have. Not at all. In fact, I know from experience in my own marriage that it's the wisdom of my wife that redirects me and keeps me from making foolish decisions. And often when, it's, when I do make foolish decisions, it's because I wasn't listening. So it's not, it's not a call to just keep your mouth shut and go with it. Second, or third, biblical submission does not mean all women to all men. This is not a universal call for all women to submit to all men. And those who try to make the Bible say that are corrupting the word of God, they're doing violence to the word of God, and they're harming people in the process. Nowhere does the Bible say that all women submit to all men. Finally, biblical submission does not mean women are inferior to men. Again, I wish this didn't need to be said, but I just want to be clear. In fact, Peter specifically says, when he uses the phrase likewise, he's referring back to the, when, the example of Christ in the end of chapter 2. Jesus, being co-equal with the Father, willingly submitted himself to the will of the Father. This is not a submission of an inferior to a superior at all. And Peter will say that women are co-heirs with men of the grace of life. Okay, so that's what biblical submission is not. We could say much more about that. But what does Peter mean then? What's he talking about when he says, wives be subject to your own husbands? What biblical submission is? Well, I mentioned a moment ago, likewise means in the same manner as submission of Jesus was not that of an inferior to a superior, but the joyful, gracious, loving, willing surrender of the Son to the will of the Father. So first, biblical submission is mutual. We're all called, all Christ followers are called to submit ourselves to the, to the authority of Jesus over our lives. We're all called, called to live surrendered, submitted lives to him, to his authority. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21, the Apostle Paul, this remarkable passage on marriage that follows this verse, he, but it begins with this one, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's how he begins this beautiful description of marriage that follows. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's mutual. Nobody's exempt from it. 
Too often I hear people talk about this concept of submission as if it's, um, it's about who gets to make the final say, who has veto rights in the relationship. You know, like you're arguing about something and, uh, and somebody's got to make the call. But that's not at all what the biblical authors are talking about. In fact, sometimes as a pastor, a couple will make an appointment to see me for some marital counseling or some help in an area. And it's not infrequent that the situation is like this. They're, They're at an impasse in something, and they both want the pastor to break the tie. They both want me to tell the other person why they're wrong. (laughs) This is, it was already accepted fact in the ancient world that women didn't have decision-making rights. Peter is actually writing something radical describing what God's vision for marriage is. Everywhere that Christianity spread in the ancient world, it liberated women. It set them free. It elevated them in a world that was often very oppressive and dominating over them. So it's mutual submission out of reverence for Christ. Second, biblical submission is voluntary. This is so important. It's voluntary. What this means is, Submission is always a gift that is offered. This is the case with Jesus. His submission was a gift he offered. He said to Pilate, you have no authority over me if it were not given to you from above. When Pilate said to him, don't you know I have the authority to take your life? Jesus says, no, you don't. It's given to you. And Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. So when it comes to our lives, we're called to voluntarily, willingly surrender to Christ. And Peter's saying to wives, you have a gift to offer to your husband. And the moment, husbands, you try to demand this, coerce this, you are being abusive and violating the word of God. Submission cannot be coerced or demanded. It can only be offered as a voluntary gift. Kathy Keller, the wife of pastor and author Tim Keller, writes this, It is the disposition of the wife to want to follow her husband and the inclination of her heart to trust him and to help him, according to her own gifts, carry out his role. However, there will be times, sadly, because we're sinful people, there will be times when a wife must say to her husband, although it's my inclination to follow you, because I serve Christ first, I can't follow you there. I can't go there with you. And husbands, we need to hear that. It's a wife who says, it's my great desire that you would be submitted to Christ and would lead in such a way that I could joyfully partner with you in seeking God's will for our family. This is the opposite of couples who come and want someone to break the tie. Third, biblical submission is powerful. It is powerful. In the same way that chapter 2, Peter says that our submission to earthly authorities is a witness to the world. Peter says that the way you live submitted lives, surrendered lives, is a witness to the glory of God. People will see that and they'll be, they'll, it'll give them cause to want to know this God that you follow. The historical context here is important. Apparently what's happening in these Asia Minor churches is that many Gentile women are coming to faith in Christ. They're coming to believe in Jesus and to follow him. And their husbands are not yet believers. What do they do? How how is this going to work? And by the way, can I just say my own experience working as a pastor in the Chicagoland suburbs, this happens a lot. That women often uh, are are moved spiritually, are are more mature spiritually at first. That They move to faith in Jesus and the husbands come along after. Well, let's look again at 1 Peter 3 verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, meaning they're not believers, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do you see that phrase? They may be won without a word. That's power. The conduct and quality of your life, honoring to Jesus, living out your faith, has power. It has power to change somebody else's heart. God can use that, and he often does. So the wife's aim is not to manipulate or to badger her husband into believing, but to take up the way of Jesus in the home, a living witness to the gospel. Sometimes I'll have uh, women that will reach out to me and say, would you reach out to my husband? Would you pray for my husband? Could you, he needs to talk to somebody. And I often want to do that, but I always wonder, does he want that? 
Or is this what you want for him? Peter was saying, the best thing you can do is to live out your faith gently, humbly, quietly, authentically before him. Finally, biblical submission is beautiful. It's beautiful. Now, I know there are those in our culture who would call it ugly. But I think, largely, that is because they're reacting to a distortion, to a corruption, to a perversion. And we need more living examples of the beauty of what God is giving us here. Again, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Matter of fact, I'm going to read verses 3 and 4 from 1 Peter. But just verse 4 you'll see here. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting out of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. Now verse 4. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. This is so, so important for us. Now, let me just first of all, what Peter's not saying Peter's not saying that jewelry is out, braided hair is out, or gold and finery is out. He's not saying that. What he's talking about is where do we put the emphasis on how we think about what is beautiful in a person? Interestingly, in the first century and the 21st century, for different, it looked different, but we're, they were culturally conditioned, as we are, to think of beauty as external. So Peter says, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. I love this. The hidden person of the heart. And this is imperishable beauty, he says. We live in a culture that's try, people are desperately trying to stay beautiful. Plastic surgery, personal trainers, makeup products, there's whole industries designed to try to fend off the aging process, keep you looking young and beautiful. And yet, inevitably, physical beauty, external beauty fades. It is fading. We're all losing the beauty of our youth. And there's no stopping it, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much money you spend. And it's not saying that external beauty is wrong. What it's saying is, if you want beauty that never fades, it only grows more beautiful over time. It is the hidden person of the heart. Can I tell you a story about when I was dating my wife, Erin, who is externally gorgeous? I was attracted to her physically, obviously. She spent a summer working with the youth ministry in, in Amsterdam in the red light district, reaching out to people that were living very broken lives, praying and doing ministry there. And she came back and she let me read some of her journal entries from that summer of what God was teaching her. I vividly remember lo- reading her prayers for me, for herself, and her journal entries about what God was showing her, and I was captivated by her spiritual beauty. Yes, I was attracted to her physically, but I was captivated by the inner, hidden person of the heart. I still am today. Young men out there who are watching this, who long to find a wife, this is what you should be praying for. This is what you should be pursuing. This is what should matter to you. Our culture is telling you different. Look for somebody who's hot. Look for somebody who, you know, who's physically attractive. And there's nothing wrong with physical attraction, but imperishable beauty, unfading beauty, is what's going on in the heart and in the soul. True beauty is a heart that is fully surrendered to Christ. For men and for women, what's beautiful, what's attractive, what's captivating is a heart surrendered to Jesus Christ. This is what we should all be personally pursuing and striving for in our own life. And this is what we should be praising in others and praying for in a spouse. Parents, this is what you should be praying for for your children should God bless them with a husband or a wife someday. Okay, now, it might seem a little unfair to you that Peter spends six verses talking to wives and only one verse coming up speaking to husbands. But just hang on, because it, what a verse it is that he has to say to husbands. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, let's talk through this verse in detail. 
I, I vividly remember hearing this verse for the first time from a man named Lazarus Piri. Lazarus is a pastor and Bible teacher in Zambia, Africa. He's a good friend and brother. At the time that I knew him, he, at first he was working in a warehouse that I worked in. I was, a, I was newly married, working in a warehouse, uh, serving in ministry. And he had that same job. We were both going to graduate school. And he quoted this verse to me. And he was trying to encourage me as a newly married young man pursuing ministry. That phrase, so your prayers may not be hindered, he said. This is the way you should treat your wife. I remember that conversation like it was yesterday, and it stayed with me all these years. First, Peter says, likewise, meaning in the same manner as. Same manner as what? The same manner as Christ, who su submitted his life to the will of the Father, in the same manner as you're called to surrender to the authorities in the world, likewise you live with your wife in an understanding way. This phrase, by the way, here, an understanding way. Literally, this means according to knowledge. Well, what knowledge? Well, not your knowledge about what, that you think you know what's best. That's not what it means. Meaning, according to your knowledge that God gives you about who your wife is. I often hear men joke like, I can't understand women. We can't make sense of women. This is a common joke among men, and I, there's some truth to that. But men, husbands, you're not called to understand all women, but you are called to understand the one that God has given you, to understand her. Become a student of your wife. Even as I say this, I feel God convicting me again. I wrote these words, I'm thinking about them. I need to do this better to my own wife. It means thinking deeply about who is she? What does she need from me? What makes her feel loved? What makes her feel secure? What are the gifts and talents God's given her? What are her passions? How can you fan those into flame? How can you support that and encourage that? How can you serve her? And how can you help her flourish and become the woman God has called her to be? Live with her according to knowledge about who she is, insight. Pray about that. Ask God, God, show me what she needs from me. Do you know... Uh, Men, why your wife often asks you about little details from moments of your past together? My wife does this. She'll say, remember when this happened? And she'll ask me almost like it's a trick question. At least that's how I feel. She's not trying to trick me. But you know why they do this? I think I know. They want to know if we're paying attention. And very often the answer is we're not. They want to know if we're paying attention, if it matters. And then Peter goes on and he says, showing honor to the woman this phrase, showing honor, by the way, is the Greek word tomeo. It, it literally, it's the same word used in chapter 2 when Peter says, honor the emperor. So remember that passage where Peter says that, that as Sarah called Abraham Lord, and that might have made you squirm a little bit. Well, you know what, guys? We're supposed to honor her in the same way that you would honor the emperor. So she calls you Lord, you call her Empress, apparently. It means to assign proper value to, to ascribe worth or value to. What is your wife worth to you, married men? What value, what's the proper value of the woman God has given you? The answer ought to be priceless. So what does it mean then to show honor to her? Well, I reached out via email, and we did, and asked some, some Chapel Street wives to tell us how their husbands show honor to them. Here's what some of them said. My husband shows me honor by being intentional about having time together by encouraging me, especially when I feel overwhelmed. He knows that, that my feeling secure is important to me and he works very hard every day to provide for us. I can relax knowing that I'm cared for. He also brings me coffee every morning, so what more could I ask for? Every morning we spend time together at a table in our bedroom. We call it table time. He always makes the coffee and serves me and I love it. My husband shows me honor by loving me unconditionally for who I am today rather than the memory of who I once was when we were first married or the idea of who he thinks I ought to be. That's good. Loving her for who she is today. My husband honors me by creating space and cultivating time spent with the Lord. He knows the best gift he can give me is showing me by example who he looks to and who he is dependent on. My husband shows me honor by being my biggest cheerleader. He always sees the best in me, builds me up in public and in private, encourages my gifts, shows interest in my passions. 
My husband honors me by seeking to be the spiritual head of our house through reading the word daily and prayerfully seeking to grow in wisdom. I love how excited he is to share what he's learning with me and our sons. He esteems my calling to ministry, sacrificing so that I can do the work that I'm called to. He treats me as a true partner in the big things and the small things. There's dozens of emails like this. They're humbling to me, convicting to me. And I would just say to many of you who these wives are referring to, we have some guys in Chapel Street Church that are doing a great job. All of us can grow. And maybe you're watching this and you're feeling the conviction like, I, I fall short. God's not trying to shame you. He's trying to call you to a different kind of marriage, a different kind of relationship. You know, I think the tendency for, for, for me and in my experience for couples is that we listen to these words and we think about the other person. Husbands, if you are listening to these words to wives about submission, you're thinking, yes, why isn't she more like that? Why doesn't she do more like that? You are missing it. You're missing the point entirely. And wives, if you're listening to these words, you're thinking, yes, why doesn't he be more understanding? He's not a student of me and he should. You're missing it. What God is saying is, let me talk to you about what I want for you, what your role is. That's where our focus should be. Finally, here in this passage, Peter says, as the weaker vessel. Now this, I know uh, some of you want to strike that out of the Bible. But let me just explain what he's talking about. Don't, don't let that trip you up. When he says weaker vessel, he's not talking about anything that has to do with competence or capacity or value or worth. We've already talked about that. That's not what he's talking about. Nor is he probably not even referring to physical strength. What he's talking about is the vulnerable position of women in the first century. They were weaker in that they had very few rights and they were, domestically speaking, vulnerable. And when a woman in our day decides to give herself to a man in a covenant relationship of marriage, when she surrenders her life and says, I'm, my life is going to be lived with you, that is a precious and holy thing. And men, you hold that and treasure that as a gift from her and from God. You never damage that. That's what he means. When a woman entrusts herself to a man, it is a great and precious gift that she gives. Never take that for granted or abuse it. Now, the most shocking and countercultural part of this whole passage in the first century might fly right by us, but I want you to hear it. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, Women were not heirs in the ancient world. And Peter is saying, in God's view, they are. There's no distinction. There's no difference. And then this last phrase, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Prayers may not be hindered. Think about that for just a minute. Let me put it to you this way. Christian men out there, if you think that you can pray to God for him to bless your business, or to give you a job, or to help you in this area of your professional life, while you mistreat, neglect, and reject your wife at home, you are kidding yourself. God's saying, I'm not listening to you. I'm calling you to obey me and honor your wife. Live with her as in an understanding way. Love her, cherish her, serve her, and you are ignoring me. So why would you think I'd be listening to you over here? It's a shocking thing. My prayers would be hindered. God would not listen to the cry of my heart in this area because I'm ignoring him in this area, in my marriage. Yes, yes, that's what he's saying. Not that he do actually doesn't hear you, but he's basically saying, obey me here. This is your first responsibility, men. This is what God wants for you first. You are accountable to God for how you treat your wife. Husbands, how you treat your wife is evidence of your true relationship with God. It reveals something about where your heart really is, what you really think matters. How highly you value your wife is an indication of how highly you value your God. Now, throughout the Bible, it's crystal clear that God intends marriage between a man and a woman to be a picture to the world of his gospel of his love. It's one of the primary metaphors Jesus uses to describe his love for the church. We're called the bride of Christ, and he is the bridegroom. 
what this means is that when, when the Bible talks about how a husband and wife should live together, it's not just how to live your best life now in marriage. It's not just ab about advice how to get along. It's saying something far grander than that. It's saying that when a husband and wife, however imperfectly, submit to Christ, when a wife surrenders her life to her husband and says, I I'm with you, we're together in this, and follows his lead, when a husband lays down his rights to bless his wife so that she can flourish, when they forgive each other, when they serve each other, the world gets a picture of God's love in action. I don't know about you, but I am convinced that our world desperately needs more pictures of God's love. And those of you watching that are married, and maybe you're thinking about all the imperfections, all the failures, all the dysfunction and pain of your marriage. God can redeem it. God can bless it. God can use it. Maybe you're longing to be married. God sees and God knows. Maybe this whole thing is just hard for you because of the pain of a failed marriage or a toxic one. God knows and understands. We can all pray for this, that when God brings a man and a woman together, the marriages of Chapel Street Church would become pictures to the world of God's goodness and grace and love in action. Let's bow together in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this ancient wisdom which is so profoundly relevant for our cultural moment right now. And I know there are many for whom this is hard to hear. But often, God, it's your gospel is a disruptive grace in our lives in every cultural context. And we need to be disrupted. We need to have your truth break through. So for, for all of us, God, speak to us and give us a vision of the way that you love us, Jesus, as a perfect spouse, and help us to love you the same. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen.